We are recording, ma'am. Um, hey, everybody on YouTube. This is Meshan Chaton and my friend Uta Hagen. Hello, everyone. I'm Uta Hagen, <laughs> uh, the author of three books now. And my most recent mm -hmm. one is In the Curated Woods, True Tales of a Grass Widow, my memoir of um, what happened to my family when the father of my children um, made the decision to think and ideate that he is a woman, including that he would identify himself as the mother of the children <laughs> and told them that he was always a woman. <laughs> All right. And, yeah. And so uh, it's very, I, I mean, there's so many things to talk about what happens to language when people overtly and purposely decide to misrepresent and lie. Absolutely. And especially when we decide as a society that when we're making our priorities, we just don't think that the most important thing is anything true or accurate, especially when it comes to issues that relate to women. Right. Yes. Like when we decide when we're ranking our priorities, just something else is above there. That just isn't the top of the list. And I, I actually think I'm thinking about this, you know, historically, I think that we have a long history of being socialized to um, speak in euphemisms about our female bodily functions. Absolutely. You know, we would call it time of the month and yes, you know, not only we're that, having lady months, problems or you know, it's we're having um, women's issues. Another one is um, I'm having my visitor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like your, you know, your friends like, come into town. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And um, it's, it's kind of it's interesting to me. I was um, thinking about how how would it have been in ancient times when people were nomads and lived in tents or something. And there's this idea um, that in, in uh, the history of the Hebrews or something in Jewish history, that there was the red tent and mm -hmm. women stayed in the red tent when they had their menstrual period. And right. um, I can't remember if it was with you that I had this conversation, but I was, I was thinking, you know, the red tent might have been a really wonderful communal place because most likely, um, isn't it when the full moon comes that you know? For we most all get people, period? yeah, either either like a full moon or a new moon for like the overwhelming majority of women, one or the other of those. Oh, I see. And so yeah, something yeah. like between seventy and eighty percent of women like consistently have their periods that they're in one or those phases. Right, and and so. Um, and also when we live with other women, we tend to get our periods at the same time. Yeah. And, and so I was thinking about this because, you know, in antiquity, uh, women didn't have much rights. They were kind of property and everything. And so, you know, it might and have been- it could even happen if you're just around other women a lot and don't live yeah. with them. Like when I was in hair school, um, ah. all, all, all the women did have them at the same time after a oh, while. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So it's just uh, probably there, like uh, you could probably do some kind of a study and find out how many hours a day do you need to spend consistently in close proximity with this particular cohort of women right. in order to kind of have your periods at the same time. I can't yeah. remember, you know, I, I taught um, with a teaching partner, the same partner for 10 years in Brooklyn. And I don't remember whether we started having our periods at the same time. Um, but uh, there's, I mean, I, I just realized actually something <laughs> about um, the fact that I was so athletic when I was a teenager that I got my first, I think one period, possibly a second one when I was 14. And, and then I didn't get my periods regularly right. until I was- Female athlete triad. Yeah, and I wasn't anorexic or anything. Um, and I, I ate a lot, but I was very, very active. I did cross country skiing in the um, winter. I had started dancing. I was doing 
you know, many hours of, of athletic activities. Yeah, I was a varsity tennis player when I was in high ah. school and I was pretty irregular too. Ah, yes. So it's something about your, your body. It's some kind of mechanism that your body is saying, I'm, we're running around so much. <laughs> yeah, we're working too we hard for you to not. be trying to grow any babies yeah. here. <laughs> I, I, I think it is uh, like a biological function or something. And um, well, it, it's but also- I will say good. I was underweight because, you know, oh. my mother was abusive and she was starving me. Like she padlocked the cabinets oh. and the refrigerator. So I was quite a bit underweight at the time too. Oh dear. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. I, that's, I, I talked- I'm throw you off. I taught some children like that, but, um, but okay. So then, but the thing is like, my mother was waiting for me to ask her for supplies. Right. right. And so, and then of course she's worried that maybe I'm doing more than I seem to be doing with that boy that we had, that I had my puppy <laughs> right. love relationship with, which I don't think we even ever kissed um, <laughs> because then he dumped me and started hanging out with the cheerleaders um yeah. which they decided to hang out with a nerdy guy for some <laughs> inexplicable reason um anyway he's like a millionaire now but um but uh i i just realized you know my mother never was direct i mean you know my mother was right. very very norwegian indirect <laughs> never <laughs> i i learned i unlearned that in my 30 years of living in brooklyn um but uh i just think about that like if it was me if, if I had a daughter <laughs> who came to me and I got my period and oh dear, and I, I think I maybe had a little bit of cramps. I was a little bit uncomfortable or something, but it wasn't too bad. And, and, um, but, you know, I, I would sit the kid down. I would want to know, like, why was my mother being so quiet about this? And I think finally, when I was a senior in high school and I graduated a semester early and then I was going to go to Germany and live with this family and, um, and take care of a kid, the au pair kind of thing. And um, then she asked me about it. And, and this is what's weird, like speaking of language, like the communication that happened then, I was, I was, uh, almost 18. It was the fall uh, before I turned 18. And so my mother is somehow broaching the subject of, you know, are you- You're a dancing serious? queen, young and sweet, only 17? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was, I mean, I was very, uh, I wasn't sexually active or I really, I didn't have a lot of boyfriends and stuff. I mean, it was, I had crushes on two guys who were not interested in me and then guys who had crushes on me I wasn't interested in them so that it works for me yeah. to have had that past but um but she was kind of anticipating you know my next four months after I graduated in January to to be in Germany and she really wanted to know like uh, what's going on and do you have to plan for this or something and then what happened is this very strange communication because I said, well, I haven't gotten any periods. She, she thought maybe I was spending my babysitting money on Tampix. Oh. My, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's just like, oh, this may one to 10 minutes. So I think we'll have to like stop and start again 10 minutes or something, but whatever. Oh, oh okay. Um, I'm just letting you know because it just sent me a notification. So I'm like, okay. It, it might let us go. I think, but, but anyway, um, Sorry. yeah, no, it's okay. But you know what? Um, my mother was upset that I wasn't getting my periods and, um, because she thought, oh, maybe there's something, uh, with fertility or something that's going to be a problem. And there right. I am. I'm not, I'm not, you know, romantically involved. I'm, I'm not intending to be, um, and, okay. but she made me go to the doctor. I remember his name was Dr. Stein. And, <laughs> and it was the pediatrician that we had, you know, after the first one retired, you know, like from when I was nine years old or whatever, I went to Dr. Stein and, um, and Dr. Stein made me take, he, or he, he strongly suggested right. that I should have to take progesterone or something. Oh, okay. gotcha. I took, I took it was probably progesterone or something and, and caused a period to happen. I right. had to take this 
hormones, I guess, for a week. Yeah. And and cause a period to happen. And I remember I was just this kid, right? Like my mother comes right. to, me, to the doctor and she's, you know, she's really not pushy. She if if the doctor had said, you know, let's wait a couple of years, just right. You know, what it's it does seem weirdly arbitrary for them to have such concern about your fertility in an age where you should definitely not be becoming anyone's mother. Yeah. And, and so, and then, but so I obediently took this because, you know, my, he sort of said, well, we should probably figure this out. Right. And, um, uh, I just, I thinking back on that, I, I mean, okay. So I, I guess I was on this progesterone or something for a week and then I got a period and then I don't think I think uh then when I went to Germany actually um the the kind of greasy food made me sick so I got like super thin in Germany and then I didn't have my period again so right. I, you know and then I come back in August of 75 and then boom, in September, I meet Nettie at folk dancing, right? And, and then, <laughs> I, then I think I think there was also something about um, if you're more around a man and and sort of reading right, pheromones, get pheromones or something, yeah. that, that then it'll stimulate that you're gonna have your periods and something. So I, I don't, um, I just, Someone could so, bother to research this, but it sounds like it's some sort of unimportant thing with women or something. So we just have to guess, right? right? Yes, <laughs> except if it means that maybe you're not going to be fertile, maybe you won't bear children. Like, why would even? I just feel like so. Why would we even contemplate that when there I am? I'm not even 18 years old. Right. Why? I mean, uh, you know. My 65 year old Uta wants to have said to Dr. Stein, why don't we just wait? Why do I have to worry about this? Because I'm not having sex, so I can't get pregnant. You know? Right. Like, this is well, not. Well, doctors have been so annoying to me about that because, you know, like I mentioned in my last video, I don't have sex. I haven't since 2016, right? Mm. So if I go in for a checkup, they ask me, are you pregnant? No. Uh, might you oh. be? No. Are you sure? No. Do you want to take a test? No. Do you want to take an STD test? No. Wow. But are you sure that you don't need to take one? Because maybe you are. I haven't been having <laughs> sex. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. You know what they even, I mean, obviously I'm postmenopausal. I'm 65, right? It's, it's been, it's been almost 10 years. Um, and it's been nine years. Because I had late menopause, but it probably I had late menopause most likely because I really didn't start having my menses regularly until I was right. older. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, and it was actually the we were waiting. We were waiting for me to go through menopause because of the fibroids, because right. I had to have two, two fibroid surgeries. Um, yeah, so but I mean, thank goodness I. Um, I've been better with doctors. I think they start to respect you when you're a little bit older, you know? Oh, yeah. No, they think I'm the dumbest person they've ever met. Like oh. I was having an issue with like really heavy periods for like a long time. Oh yes. And right. they, um, I had a few doctors suggest that I just like have a baby. Cause like, maybe it'll be better after work. Um, and I was like, can I get like a hysterectomy or something? Cause like I was having issues with anemia. Like they were right. telling me like, you know, you're going to have to get like a blood transfusion. And I was like, oh, well, I don't goodness. want one of those. And like, I don't know, I'm really sensitive to iron. So I was having serious iron oh. toxicity symptoms when yeah. I was trying to take the tablet. So I was just uh -huh. like, I don't know what you guys want from me here. And yeah. they were like, well, uh, what if you want to have a baby? And I'm like, I don't. And they're like, but like, what if you change your mind? And I'm like, I don't think I'm going to. And if I do, then like, I don't know. Oh, well, who cares? Like I'm, I'm bleeding right now, you, honey. <laughs> like, and, and they were scary. like, well, what if you get like a husband and then like he wants a baby? <laughs> um, what if like the love of yeah. your life, like wants a baby? I'm like, why would he be the love of my life if he wants a baby and I don't want a baby? I think <laughs> I, would, I would love somebody else. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> like, and it's just like, okay, so you're telling me the, the reason we're having this conversation about my health care is because a man I don't know and haven't met might want babies I don't want. That's why. Like, that's why that's, this is the tone of this conversation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, I'm, I don't even have, 
I'm not even pregnant yet. And y'all already choosing my babies over me. I don't appreciate <laughs> it. Now I know y'all will let me die in that hospital. If something went down. Cause I know you're going to pick them first. Cause they ain't even here. And you already picked them. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, this is actually pretty interesting. I think in terms of the language and the communication, because it seems to me like, for example, um, I think that women who are sexually active get quite a bit of pressure to use the pill. Oh yeah, for... I was I was given so much pressure for that even when I wasn't having sex. Like even since I haven't been, anytime I go to the gynecologist, they're trying to pressure me to get on the pill. I'm like, I don't need it. And they're like, well, uh, you know, maybe like it could be like good for you for like other reasons. I'm like, I'll have other reasons. My skin's fine. Look at my face. Like we're, I don't, Nope, nope. I don't want to be on hormones for no reason, dog. Like, I don't know why y'all right. are trying to sell this. Because um, um, it started, I, I, I never used, I never took the pill. I took um, it briefly and I put on 70 oh, pounds in less than five months. Oh, uh, yes, because well, it wasn't it, a fan. the pill makes your body think you're pregnant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was yeah. up to a size 16. Ooh. So, yeah. Yeah. And probably, uh, you know, what goes along with that is like high blood pressure and things like that. Oh, yeah. Those yeah. like those readings were like crazy um, to the point where like, uh, you know, once uh, the nurse was like, oh, like you're close to like the range for like a stroke. I'm like, yo, y'all aren't going to just kill me for no reason out here. So you decided, did they, did they tell you, did they suggest to you, maybe you need to not take this um, uh, no. birth control pill anymore? Wow. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean that, you know, that too, I see that the lack of progress, um, in women's birth control, I see that yeah. as part of our linguistic history, our situation. Right. And right. I just, I, I think there's so many things that, we don't know uh, about women's health. We are health. going to have to pause here because oh. it turned out for some reason, oh. I'll figure it out. Um, okay. Uh, weirdos. Uh, oh, and I have to press continue, just a second. There, okay. yes. <laughs> no, I, I was, I think I was saying that um, I insisted on just using the diaphragm and yeah. um and you know um, whenever and just I, real quick just in case people anybody who's watching might not know what a diaphragm is oh yes um uh can you tell tell yes. us what a diaphragm okay. is so <laughs> a diaphragm is a, a rubber disc that's that's um uh made uh, it's fitted to fit mm -hmm. just uh below your cervix and the way I used it was with uh, spermicide and, mm -hmm. and, and you have to, and it folds. Um, I don't know how to, comp how to wh what else folds like that, but it, it folds into something long <laughs> mm -hmm. and then you insert it. And, and, um, and it was easier for me to insert after a little bit of foreplay. And so uh, it would be this little interruption. And I sort of felt like, if, if I thought I was going to, you know, we were at the beginning of something and there was complaints about that or complaints about the condoms at, you right. know, at uh, the initial few weeks and complaints about having to go get tested for STDs right. or something, then I felt like, well, you're not on the A list. It sounds like your sexual health is too much trouble for me. So yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you yes. are probably not a great candidate. Um, yes, and I was I was actually really kind of shocked about the the um, part of the conversation that that you had with um, Antoinette, Belle Antoinette, about guys who want to you know secretly slip off the condom or something. Yeah, I've I I mean, oh my goodness, I I don't know, I, I would. I think I'd be accused of murder because I would like push the guy <laughs> off my balcony or something if he did that to me. 
I mean, this well, is- they usually like, because they're doing it secretly, usually the actual circumstance in which this happens to you is either a circumstance involving drugs or alcohol where you're not paying oh, attention uh, well, or uh, it's uh, dark. So yeah. the whole point is that you don't know they've done this. No, I know. Yeah. So yeah, huh. like, yeah, if you catch them, you can have a situation, but the reason they call it stealthing and not just oh. announcing to you that I'm removing it oh. <laughs> is that they're trying to do this without you knowing they're doing it. Wow. I just, I'm, I'm astounded actually. I'm, I'm just, I'm very glad that I'm, I'm not in the running for any dating yeah. type of stuff. You know, I've got my guy and it's all set yeah. <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, Real mm. glad about that. It is rough out here. I saw a report, yes. um, a fairly large study of college age women where uh, 58% of the participants, the female participants reported uh, having been uh, choked in their, uh, at some point in a sexual encounter. 53% of those said it was completely unexpectedly. And 26% oh said it happened in their last encounter, like their most recent encounter. So that's how common that commonly that's happening these days. Um, I'm glad I'm old. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> this is, you know, and I feel like it does really, it is kind of related to the emphasis on sex that mm -hmm. is um, in conjunction with um, the gender woo, the yeah. what I call the cross sex ideology. I sort of, mm -hmm. you know, like if, if we want to sort of segue into this, you know, non word gender being yeah. substituted for sex. I mean, I feel that this was, I mean, um, okay. So well, it's such a wonderfully stretchy, flexible word, right? Because yeah. you could use gender to uh, refer to sex, you could use it to refer to stereotypes, you could use it to refer yes. to personality characteristics, right? You could use it to refer to uh, preferences and things that you like. Um, yes. It's a very, very bendy kind of word. Yes, right. And it belongs with grammar. It doesn't belong with any kind of description of the identity of a human being. It, yeah. It, it is. Um, it doesn't fit. It doesn't go. Um, right. Yeah. And uh, and I was just looking up how um, who was it? Uh, John Money. Was yeah. The one Dr. Who, John Money. Who been, yeah. Dr. John Money, who scandalously uh, did was a pedophile, along yeah. with terrible theories and stuff about how. How. Uh, our sexual, our, our biological sex is not immutable that, you know, I think that um, when you look at the history of all he this, seems to think that, that that's sort of an idea that's imposed upon people, whether you're a man or a woman, like it's something like your parents tell you or something that like, kind of like how yeah. you teach them the ABCs. He seems yes. to think that like, you know, you, you teach them boyness or girlness. Yes. Well, I think I think this is kind of interesting because you know women, we're, we're we start out as girls. We're we don't get periods until we hit puberty, and then we have to adjust at the end of our fertile years, and and you know things physically are just a little bit different um, yeah. after you stop having your periods, and there's I guess less estrogen and stuff produced in your body. Right. And um, uh, I, I was, I mean, for me, I think I was kind of fortunate because I, I haven't had, you know, I didn't have a hard time with menopause and I, um, I don't feel like things have changed so much. I kind of anticipated that I would be maybe more stiff in my joints and stuff, but right. I don't, I don't really have that problem, but, you know, I think it, women literally physically are more flexible and I think yeah. that actually mentally and emotionally, we're more flexible too. And I think that that Definitely. is, that is, a, you know, social, um, but it's also biological. Right. Because and I mean, the yeah. social is, reflects the biological and the other way around, right? You know? Yes. Yes. And then, but then we have this um, other, what I call wrong think that's, 
Okay. <laughs> That's a phrase that I want to be, I want to invent and I want credit for it. It's 2022 and Uta Hagen invented wrong think, nice. <laughs> which is an incorrect mindset so that you are looking at some patient of yours, if you're a psychologist or something, mm -hmm. or you're looking at how men and women respond in sexual situations, but you have such a stereotyped mindset. You are the subject of centuries of stereotypes about what men and women do, despite right. the fact that, for example, a lot of women died and children were left motherless and the father had to step mm -hmm. up and try to mother these children too and yeah. vice versa women always like my was, grandmother she yeah. lost her mother uh, to a stroke at the age of six and she was ah. like 12 or 13 so her oh father goodness. wound up having to raise all of them and you know she talked about how you know of course he cooked he cleaned he taught them how to do that you know they need their wow. hair done for school he got out the press and go I'm like because wow. I mean, he, he's got to do it. Who's, who else is going to do it? So, and, and look at that. I mean, you know, people, some people in the other camp today would be saying, oh, he probably wanted to be a woman. He was probably a transsexual <laughs> or something, you know, your grandfather, like, look at how he was mothering all these children and doing their hair and doing all these stereotypically female things. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is what I want to point to when, when Blanchard and, some of these typically often male, um, yeah, cantor, yes, Bailey, yeah. etc. Um, what was I calling them? I call, I had a name for them, not the three stooges, but something like <laughs> that. Um, but see, they're, they're, um, they're based on, on non-information. They're based on, on stereotypes and, <laughs> uh, tradition and, um, you know, I, I, this whole thing about, like, I was looking up like money, um, mm -hmm. believed John money, who was mostly operating active, uh, professionally in the 1950s and sixties. And there was this famous case mm -hmm. of this Reimer kid who got damaged. Yeah, David during, Reimer. Yeah. He got um, damaged during a circumcision and then they did bad stuff and raised him as a girl, but then he he knew at like the age nine or something that he's really a boy. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, that is, you know, talk about a weird wrong body thing. And then later he committed suicide right. and so did his twin brother. Yeah. Um, and then money was. And like the point of kind of doing that sort of thing in that way. And why it was such a good, uh, I guess, case study is because you had a direct comparison, right? You had a control because you had a twin oh. brother. So, and right. they were also raised in the same household. So that yes. meant that you, that was a right. good sort of setup for right. a, an ethical research experiment. Right. So he, he had his, his own little Dr. Mengele shtick going on. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the, the thing is he was later found out to be a pedophile and he like took photographs of kids and all, all kind of really yeah. unacceptable stuff, but he's still cited. And like a lot of the, a lot of the founders of a lot of this sort of research associated with this, it was very common for them to either be found to have been like some kind of pedophile, like uh, Alfred Kinsey, they horrible, no good, very bad things done to very young children all oh, the way down right. to babies. Oh, yes. I forgot. Um, right. Yeah. And, um, and also like some of these like theorists, even if it was, they were not found to be like dead to rights, definitely like offenders in some way, they were huh. found to have also had ideas about childhood and matters of huh. a sexual nature. Right. Like they're like, their their theories on sort of like the expansive the supposed like expansiveness of sexuality or sexual freedom or whatever was yes. often you right. know you know what what people do when they're sort of rehabilitating them from a historical perspective is right. they'll talk about how they were expansive in regards to things like gender expression or being like you know more like or about homosexuality or bisexuality right but they won't talk about the part where they were also very expensive about the whole age question right they yes. will, they'll leave that part of their description of the ideologies of these people and so i'm, when I'm we're talking saying, about them in the present 
you know, I mean, this whole field is tainted. I'm not understanding how it is that Dr. Christine Wheeler, who diagnosed my husband, as she claims in her sworn affidavit from 1996, on July 20th, 1993, um, in one appointment, in right. one 50 minute hour, she diagnosed my now ex-husband, my then husband. I didn't, I, this was actually something that it didn't register with me at the time, because I remember when my attorney received this affidavit from saying all these, um, you know, claims about me, a person that she had never met, and that I was uh, the reason that I was questioning the custody arrangement and talking about how quickly these changes were happening and how the children were in a state of Struggling. grief. Yeah. yeah, they were in a state of grief. That the only re she said the reason that Uta is saying this is um, because I seek to punish my husband and I do not nice. accept. I do not accept how other people are accepting of his um, uh, choice of how he presents himself, or, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. His emerging as his true self or whatever, you know. And, and see, that whole thing with this person who had this very limited kind of, you know, clinical uh, experience who made all these very definitive statements in court is in a very ugly way kind of reflecting in the situation with Ms. Hurt because yes. what was yes. said about her uh, by the clinical psychologist that was hired by him after four hours of fancy dinner and drinks right. is this woman said um, that her primary sort of like motivating like feature or factor was rage towards him suppressed rage she had this right anger oh the word him. rage is all over the affidavit this that this dr wheeler wrote about me and it's like she never even spoke to me on the phone how can you right. you know and it was and that was a prepared a year before she met amber Hurt. what she wound up saying to the court she wound up having one session with her a year after everything was already signed off she See, just prepared it based of off of her opinions and notes i and guess what his camp said I guess judges are supposed to d defer to a court qualified PhD psychologist or something, but but it's it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would a judge accept any of this? This this is this is hearsay. I I well, I well, you have to I think yeah. rely on a lawyer who is going to do like when they are cross-examining this person you have yeah. to rely on a lawyer going okay did you meet this person how much time did you spend with right. them and so the jury hears this person say i didn't meet them i didn't spend this time with them uh -huh. because my understanding of how court testimony works like as evidence is that yes uh you know just testimony like the word of a person is considered to be evidence but like the juries are instructed to weigh this based on how credible this person yes. is and right. the credibility they decided based off of consistency they decided based off of how likely it is that they would have actual firsthand knowledge based on what kind of comes out with that so what should have happened for you ideally is yes. that your uh you know lawyer when they were cross-examining this person after they you know testified against you made sure to ask questions that revealed to the jury yes. that this person didn't really have a foundation for this kind of knowledge and they should take it with a grain of salt essentially yeah well see my ideally would have my happened. divorce did not go to trial sometimes i think it should have gone to trial sometimes i think that my divorce should have been a big messy splashy thing and it should have hit the new york post and maybe page three of the new york times or something this big custody fight um uh it's it's very uh it's very interesting to do this linguistic analysis of this, of, mm -hmm. of these old papers. And um, I think that what I'm putting on my blog, utahagengrasswidow.wordpress.com with little excerpts from um, those affidavits, I feel that that's actually really important because Absolutely. there are other women going through this stuff. And, um, I ended up paying my attorney so that he could stomp around in his office and waste his time and my money um, 
having a reaction to this nonsense, right? right. But this nonsense it's nonsensical and probably triggering even to witness. Oh yes. And this nonsense was written by someone with a PhD who now calls herself a sexologist. I can't, I have to, you know. I, I have a lot of doubts about that field because I seem yeah. to, it's, it seems to all be very theoretical. There seems to not be a lot of very like sort of solid research. No. I don't, I'm not seeing a lot of large studies of any kind. I'm not seeing any control no. groups anywhere. Um, no. I can only imagine if hard sciences are having replication crises, it's a disaster over there. Right. Like, it's a racket. Uh, it's a racket. <laughs> It's full you know, of conflict of interest I mean, because there's yeah. automatic conflict of interest because you are going to have this individual come to you. You are the guru. You are the one who has the reputation that you will write those affidavits and you will trash the wives who want to get divorced. And this mm -hmm. is part of, you know, I see it's, it's, it's really um, remarkable for me to really because of through your interest in this, um, I was ignoring previously the uh, depth heard uh, proceedings. And I think most people want to, unless they're interested in celebrity like gossip. I, I can understand yeah. the impulse to just kind of ignore this, like more, more drama, whatever. But I'm seeing what, what is really bothering me is I'm seeing male commentators all over saying, well, she was abusive to him and da-da-da and it's nothing and, you know. Right, why are we they were both bad. He right. never got to get his right. say. Like, as a matter you know, of fact, why, why should he get in trouble and not, I, not her? Yeah, I, I checked in. I was, um, sometimes I kind of advertise my book, which is available from iuniverse.com slash bookstore. <laughs> and it will be linked in the description. Thank you, great. Um, uh, I, I sometimes, you know, kind of advertise it on relevant um, YouTube comments and stuff like that. And so I went over to trigonometry mm -hmm. and they happened to be doing a, um, a live stream, uh, Constantin and whatever the other guy's name is, and Francis, Francis. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, sometimes I think that they come off being pretty intelligent and funny and, and so on. And they, they have interviewed significant people. However, mm -hmm. um, they were just doing this live stream where, you know, they've got a lot of people who want their question to be up there. So they donate five pounds or two dollars right. or whatever. They, they, so, they super chat. So they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever they have to say. Right. Yeah. Yes. And so, um, but there was someone who referenced the Depp Herd um, circus and mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, criticism of herd it was clearly uh, like a, a male yeah. name was attached to this and and she's Francis, been largely derided across the internet like all across social right. media sites for some for some time here but she's Virginia. the one who's getting sued what yeah. you know she was the one who was served papers right mm -hmm. it's and and i don't think she's initiated any suits what she did was never exercise her freedom of speech and still maintain Depp's um, privacy because it right. could have been someone that she was referring to who she had a relationship before she was involved mm -hmm. with him. And um, I, I had to go away and turn it off the trigonometry thing because um, I found it really kind of insulting, you know, as a woman. Absolutely that that these I, I wonder how many fights in marriages this this thing is causing for people who are following uh, it because one thing that's kind of interesting is you know this is pure speculation land but her co-star in the Aquaman man movie Jason Moe who plays Aquaman yeah. he's going through a divorce right now and his uh like stepdaughter said publicly that she believes Johnny, ja Johnny Depp and his now former wife said that she is, you know, as close friends with Johnny Depp and she believes him. He seems to have stuck with her. And obviously he just did this movie with her and he's made no statements against her. I don't know that this is related in any way to their divorce, but I would be unsurprised if this at least caused a lot of tension in their home. You know, it's very interesting because Johnny Depp is kind of reminding me of my ex-husband whom I have named Nettie for the purposes of my writing. And um, uh, 
it just because of his capacity to influence other people against the beleaguered wife. Absolutely. You no, know? I mean, and I mean, the thing is, uh, clearly in the power structure of their relationship, he had most of the power. Right. Yeah, I mean, he had the longer career before her. He had much more wealth coming into the marriage. She'd had no significant sorts of roles to where she was known as anything other than someone who's had some bit parts before, uh -huh. like um, her relationship with him. Um, her like first big movie was with him. Um, and they you know, fell in love on the set of that movie and wound up getting married not long afterward. Like, you know he had, you know, all of this sort of notoriety. He was very well known. Like it was right. very unbalanced. And of course the age factor, because I believe right. she was 25 and so he much was older. like 50 something. Yeah. And the thing is she's pursuing a career in acting and he's well established and has lots of connections. I mean, it's absolutely, it's kind of hard to resist that. It, 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 you know, I was thinking about this because um, I embarked at one point um, when my children were still at the elementary school <laughs> into an ill-advised um, relationship, but there were, there were like a, a half a dozen people wanting to set us up playing Yenta with the assistant principal of the school and mm -hmm. myself, who was a parent at the school. And so of course, you know, being beleaguered as I was with this. Obviously you want to be the queen of the PTA, which is an admirable uh, sort of aspiration. Well, and I feel you, I see where you're going. <laughs> well, uh, he liked to use me as arm candy at any of the uh, you know, PTA functions because, um, you know, he and his, he and his previous wife, um, were not getting along and she refused to go to all these things, but I was a parent in the school. And after, after we were involved for like, say we kept a secret for maybe four to six months. And then right. I just, this, I, we just, the thing is I had already taught a lot of children by then. And, you, you can get kind of famous just being a pre-K teacher. Like I remember walking into the remake of, um, they had a recolorization or something of The Wizard of Oz. Fabulous. And and he and I, I think we took my kids to this theater called The Pavilion in um, Park Slope, Brooklyn. And um, uh, we got there kind of late or something, but, and it was really like a full house. There was all these kind of, you know, uh, yuppie type parents taking their kids because they remembered, you know, seeing the Wizard of Oz and stuff. And, and yeah. Um, yeah, and, and they would be like, oh, there's Mr. Bernstein. I'm making up a name. It's not his real name. Oh, there's Mr. Bernstein. And look, there's Miss Uta. Oh, look. Oh, they're together. Oh, my goodness. Maybe they're going to get married. You know, it's so cute. All oh, these little kids, yeah. right? And, and, um, uh, but I think that, that, uh, it, 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 crazy it, to make a long story short, he ended up remarrying his ex-wife. She made a play to get him back. They were already divorced. And, of course. and then later, then they had another wedding where they actually registered for gifts and stuff like that. And yeah, I thought, oh, tacky. <laughs> The oh unmitigated goal. Yeah. Like you, you guys know full well, you should just hit the courthouse and act like nothing had ever happened. You yes. tried it. Right. No, no, no. It was a big, it was like, a, it was as if it was a fundraiser. <laughs> you know, their divorce had been expensive, so they needed to make that up. But, um, but I have to say that it was appealing to me to be in a relationship when I am this beleaguered mom at the school whose ex-husband all over the place is saying, I'm, you know, I'm nutty nutty and this is my son. Uh, I use the names Elon and Oren. These are my sons, Elon and Oren Netty. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people could tell the Adam's apple, the hands, the feet too big, all this kind of thing, right. but, and kind of awkward and self-conscious and whatever, but, um, but it, it meant that I was kind of famous in the school, being the girlfriend of the assistant principal. And he was kind of a a theatrical guy, as many school right. administrators are, you know, oh, yeah. they're on stage all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, I have my, my theatrical side, because if you teach pre-K and kindergarten, you have to 
come in and the class, so much can do go this, on, go right? Do that. You know? Got to give you guys lots of energy, or you get yeah, bored right. looking at like, me. Do this. Now do this. <laughs> now do this. You know, all this kind of stuff, just to get them to settle down, and you know. Yeah. So, so when I taught French for a little bit, I learned very oh. quickly that being very, very bouncy and very yeah. sort of like animated really helped keep right. them engaged. So I do, yeah. I can definitely right. relate to yeah. how yeah. you can't just so, be like, hey class, today right. we're going to do whatever we're going to do. But I think that at the beginning of the relationship, I didn't pay attention to what a narcissist he was. I didn't pay attention to how difficult her, his daughters were, who were just a little older than my son's. And his oldest daughter would call my, my kids big man and little man. And I felt that that was very insulting, particularly to my younger son. And I really wanted him to get her to stop that. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I think that one reason why, why this woman made a play for to get her ex-husband back is because I was going to teach. She hit the roof when she found out I was going to teach her daughters how to knit. <laughs> and she, she was this accountant and she was kind of cold, you know, not a, not a real, not like me. Yeah. And, and uh, she wasn't and a preschool the, teacher. <laughs> she, she, she was an accountant who worked for the city. And, and, um, uh, and I think she made more money than him. And uh, she, she was so threatened by, you know, her ex-husband, like she was the one who wanted the divorce. She initiated the divorce and, and, you know, and, and that's the thing is, you know, men have this problem with, um, they, they feel lost, you know what I mean? And, and they, yeah. and they don't like it when women don't feel lost. We, we have our feelings, right? But I have to say that there was uh, what I would call a personal relationship conflict of interest here that I, yeah. I, let myself be talked into that, you know, we could handle it professionally and stuff like that. It doesn't matter that I'm a parent in the school, which actually it, it, it shouldn't have been that a parent at the school is dating the, uh, the assistant principal. But, you know, uh, it's hard to meet people. You know, we, we made all right. sorts of excuses. But the thing is, um, there were signs that uh, it's, I was making a mistake at the beginning, yeah. pretty early on. Yeah, like he happened to mention, <laughs> this is like on the third or fourth date or something, he mentions that one time he had sex in a cemetery. We're passing a cemetery and he just casually mentioned one time he had sex in a cemetery out in the open. And I was like, I'm not gonna have sex in a cemetery. I don't know why you're telling me this, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I mean, okay. he was telling you this because he wanted to make sure you had all the red flags. So the yes, word turned out exactly. he was crazy. He was like, like well, I already told yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I already told you. I told you who I am. You know who I am. Yeah. I'm a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a shl- I'm a schmuck. I'm kind of a schlemiel. Okay, that's the who only I time am. we've I ever had that happen in fiction was an actual vampire in the Vampire Diaries did that. Oh. Girl, why didn't you run? What was happening? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, he also told me that he had had an affair or like a one night stand with someone at a teacher conference and he cheated on his wife. Like, why did he tell me this? Right. He said, well, of course he's telling you this because he has intentions of cheating on you. And when it (laughs) happens, what he wants to do is be like, I already told you, you did that. You didn't have a problem with this. So what's all this out of you now? Yeah. I think that, I think that there's something, and I think it, it does have to do with uh, the fact that he was a narcissist and um, he was the youngest son, you know, in a Jewish family and his mother really <laughs> doted on him and all this stuff, you know, I mean, like a good person, he worked real hard. He, he really tried. He had been a science teacher and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm not saying he was all bad and well, nobody's all bad, but yeah. And Johnny Depp uh, is very charming. Uh, but, but he's, he's probably honest too, right? Like he was probably honest about the drug use. He was probably honest about this or that, right? And, and that's the problem with a narcissist. Like they're gonna mm-hmm. say, but I was honest with you. I told you this. I told you that I snort Coke. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I told you this. Like, why are you complaining? Because I told you this. Right, right? And you were fine with this, right? Like, you know, you're yeah. here, I told you. Like, what, what what is all this now? Yeah, but I, you know, 
I don't want to ever um, come off as as just being completely fed up with men and stuff. I mean, I I think that that both sexes have our own um, challenges. And at, I mean, men can make beings, perfectly good friends, furniture yes. movers, um, <laughs> household furniture, uh, statue models. They're they're great. They're great for lots of things. <laughs> Well, my guy plays the piano, so that's very <laughs> special to me. You know, it's, um, he just started playing ragtime. A lot of Scott Joplin. It's it's that's very fun. interesting. Yeah, I mean, he's been he sw- he you know added that to like Brahms and Beethoven and Bach, and and uh, you know, ragtime is complicated to play actually. Oh, I bet yeah. it sounds like yeah. it is. It's it's got subtle chords and a lot of syncopations and. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm really, I'm really glad, you know, that he's a musician. I've always been a bit of a sucker for musicians that, that has a, a, there's a yin and a yang about that, you know, and I, I just think women need to be more honest. We, you know, um, I, I think that it would be much better if the psychologists are telling these guys who come in and say, listen, I've been wondering if I really wanted to be a man. I think I actually want to be a woman. And all this and I'm going to have to go out and try it and lie to my wife and spend money and all this kind of stuff because I need to figure this out it is oh how do you say this in French idée fixée yeah uh, idée fixée yeah and um like an idea that won't let go of you yes yeah, st- fix, fixed concept yeah. yeah and um uh or uh, would you translate it into into English as like an obsession do you think or or it's yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, the thing is, if the psychologist would say, you know, there's starting to be quite a few women who decades later are writing their books <laughs> about their lives. They're writing their memoirs. Like, you know, this, this woman, Uta Hagen, she's become famous about this, her, her in the curated woods. She really, you know, just so you know that, <laughs> I don't know, 25 to 40 years later, she might write a book under a pseudonym and you'll, don't figure out who you are and you'll kind of be exposed for the shit you did oh yeah somebody <laughs> might dox your wife on the internet <laughs> yeah right it's crazy out here anything could happen you never know yeah i i am uh, so far moved away from that thank goodness i'm i'm all <laughs> i'm all um all into my transplanting and um i take out my my rage or whatever it is that I have on the dandelions and on the garlic mustards. They have to go. They are. There'll be no weeds in this garden. They are colonizers from Europe. They have to go. I want wildflowers. Oh, I've got Jack in the pulpit. I've got Columbine. I've got um, Sweet Sicily coming up and uh, Solomon Seal. I'm, I'm really excited about all the wildflowers and a ton of violets. If I don't have more, great spangled fritillaries than I did last year. I don't know. I'll eat my hat. Yeah. So I don't want us to suddenly be cut off again. And I think this, this actually might be a good length. Don't you think? Yeah. 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 We got three minutes and we can wrap. Um, yeah. I think that's a good thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Don't, no, don't ask people to go for an hour and a half or something like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know when you get it up i'll put it on my blog okay um and i've got 50 something followers so you know um i i really do want your your channel to yeah. <laughs> so well. yeah it's gonna be a thing here. yes yes <laughs> i so enjoyed talking to you and i want to thank you enjoyed you know for too. reaching out to me you were have been a great support um and you know uh everything that's happened i don't like to say it's for a reason but i think that you can learn you can learn from whatever it is that happens and try to have got the right kind of perspective then any uh, life situation that you manage to survive can give you some more perspective and some more wisdom and experience to go with from that point Yes. And I, I think it's, it's really important for us to really analyze like this. Like what I, what I find with, with my guy, you know, he's great. He's a musician and, and he's also a good cook and we, we have really mm-hmm. great talks and stuff. And he has a daughter and a granddaughter mm-hmm. <laughs> and, 
and uh, his wife had died. So, so I'm kind of like the substitute grandma and, um, oh, what was I going to say now? Ah, so uh, there's, you know, I, I'm not going to say it happens with all men all the time or anything like that, but sure. Hashtag not all men. Yes. And, um, however, I can see him kind of, you know, you know how when a man can't hear all the details that women are going into and we're talking mm -hmm. about, yes, but we should say it differently and we need to explain better what it is that we're going through and our perspective and how we feel, then maybe we wouldn't be treated the way we're treated or something like that. Like, let's right. figure out what to do. Right. But if I, I can just see this kind of like, he, he starts to kind of fall asleep. Right. He just. He tunes out. And, and I think oh, my yeah. father I did that, you know? That. Yeah, I mean, my father, <laughs> my father had to do it. I mean, he has five daughters. He had five daughters and a wife. And so we'd be <laughs> all talking and finishing each other's sentences and leave off. And, and we've got to wrap our recording. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So, <laughs> yep, good. I think so. We will definitely, <laughs> let's make this some kind of regular thing. I think it's a good Absolutely. idea. Thank you. Thank you, my chatona. Is it chatona or chaton? Chaton. Chaton. Ah, okay. <laughs> We're going to help with my French. My French is very bad. I can, <laughs> I can say, qu'est-ce que vous voulez? And that's about it. <laughs>